I think one of our challenges is whether we make FM sound in any way interesting and exciting as a career. Uh, and later on, I'll share with you a job ad I saw earlier this week, which made me almost want to slip my wrists because it was so dull. It was so dull. Um, I'll share that with you a bit later on. First of all, I'm going to ask each of the panellists just to quickly introduce themselves, tell you who they are, where they work, what their organisation does, and if they feel like it, uh, an, an unknown fact, something about them that we don't yet know. So, Jo, let's start with you. <laughs> I'm Jo Wake. I'm Global Head of Facilities and Real Estate for Deliveroo. Um, we're a food delivery business and the fastest growing tech company in Europe. Come back to me on the fun fact once I've had to think about it. Jo, how did you come across your job? How did you find your job? Um, they approached me, actually. Um, I was at King before, who made Candy Crush and Farm Heroes, so I, I'm used to uh, working in facilities in the tech industry. Um, so they approached me and actually I was offered this role on the morning and in the afternoon I was made redundant. So that was, someone was looking down on me. That was a, that was a good day. Um, <laughs> so there's, there's actually quite a lot of ex-King people at Deliveroo. Um, a year ago it wasn't as big as it is now, but it was just a very exciting opportunity to um, be involved in, in something controversial, huge, growing, um, and something different. Thanks, Joe. Nick? Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Nick Thompson. I am the Director of Workplace Services for Royal Mail Group. I'm six weeks in to my new appointment, um, having spent six years prior to that with Sodexo. Uh, I was approached by the Royal Mail around about May last year. Um, it was probably not the most obvious career move for myself, but um, I went through a very, very uh, honest selection process with uh, Royal Mail Group. They were very, very honest about uh, they cha their challenges, what they wanted to achieve, uh, etc. So it was, uh, it was warts and all discussions. I started the role um, in March. Uh, it's been quite an interesting six weeks, uh, as, as you can imagine. Uh, lots of challenges. Um, interesting fact about me that's not widely known, um, I am a, a mad fan of heavy metal music, always have been, uh, and on my right arm I have a full sleeve uh, that's been recently completed and it's got all my guitar heroes on it, um, so uh, that's my interesting fact list. Thank you very much, Jackie, Be that. I can't beat it back and connect to it. <laughs> so I'll save my interesting fact. I'm Jackie Cooper. I'm Head of Service Performance and Development for GSK. Um, my team um, supports the FM side of the business, not, not particularly the, the real estate part, but act as a centre of excellence um, in many ways. Um, I've been with GSK for four and a half years, and my background prior to that is I'm actually a chef made good. Um, like many people, I started in the food service sector. Um, so there's a delightful irony that having worked for Sodexo in the past, um, I'm now their biggest global client. They seem to like that. Um, so I was brought in specifically to be, and I quote, constructively disruptive. I keep forgetting the constructive bit, but I've definitely been disruptive to look at the way we approach services to the employees of GSK in terms of adding value um, as per the conversation earlier. My interest in fact is I am not a fan of heavy metal music and I might be a very old lady now but I did date Phil Lynott from Thin Lizzy once. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, there's, there's a real connection there. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Thanks, Jackie. Okay, Adam, over to you. Right, so, um, I won't go through the whole story again, but I'm Adam Mason from Pure Gym. Pure Gym is the largest uh, ever gym company in the UK with over a million members and 200 sites. Um, our plan over the next four to five years is to double in size again um, and really disrupt the gym market. Um, and make uh, 
well-being, cost-effective for everybody, and it doesn't matter whether you're a student or whether you work in central London, you've got access to gym and gym equipment when you need it any time um, that you need it to a 24-hour operation. Um, I'm two and a half months in um, after leaving B&Q, and I have to say it's great to be a young uh, company that is really pushing to the forefront of, of the market and the technology they're using. Um, fun fact about me, uh, well, I used to uh, race toy cars. Um, some people would say professionally, but for Ansman Racing, um, that manufactured uh, radio controlled cars in America, and I was lucky enough to have fun doing that for a couple of years. Wow, what a, what a panel. <laughs> I'm quite blown away by some of those facts. Thank you all very much. So we're here to talk about the skills gap in FM. And uh, Joe, your delivery has been on a real sort of fast growth period recently, hasn't it? And I know you've been on a big recruitment drive. How's that been for you? Um, it's, been, it's been tough. We've been recruiting from anything from reception through to real estate leads. Um, I've been doing some recruitment in Paris and Singapore as well, and the difference across the three markets has been um, huge. If we take uh, the recruitment in Singapore, I've, I've met some hugely impressive, very snappy, competitive, um, great interviewers that have then... Um, it, I've, I've never been in a position where I've had four, five, six people who are at shortlist who I've just been tearing my hair out because I don't know who to take on. And they've followed it up with great emails and they've kept up the LinkedIn messages and really great engagement. And they've been very humble when they haven't um, been, been given um, any opportunities. Um, UK has been really tough. I've had hundreds and hundreds of CVs and maybe out of 200 CVs, it might be two people that... Are worth a worth a phone call it's just no one's got any passion or punchiness or um, drive and I don't know whether it's because they think they're coming to delivery where it's very everyone's in jeans it's very laid back like we work freaking hard um, to you know don't be don't be um, fooled by by what you see and everyone playing you know on their virtual reality goggles playing PlayStation um, and I think it's something that we can learn from as well through the interview process is uh, how, how do we weed out those those people who aren't fit for, for what we're what we're looking for? Um, and I think that's why you know talking today about how we just see the same people on the same panels talking about the same stuff. Um, I said to Lee and the team that you know we need to do something different, and this is something that I'm really passionate about, and something that we have to do something about. We have a responsibility to the industry um, and to ourselves as we grow our teams and to, to other people coming up in the industry. You know, we're all in very privileged, privileged positions um, by where we are today in our positions and what we can do to, to give back. Um, and there's given me, I think, lots of food for thought of things that people have said today and I think things that are gonna come out in the conversation. So um, I think, you know, there's lots of learning points for me as well as how we can, um, you know, with the recruitment, how we can improve it. When you were recruiting, Joe, were your adverts asking for people with FM experience, or were you just looking for people who could do the job really well? Um, I think it. I think, I think it depends. If we're looking at a very specific real estate lead, then yes, they need to have that relevant experience. But absolutely happy to take on receptionists, coordinators, assistant FMs with with little experience because I'm much more about the the passion and the personality and and whether they're going to be open to, to learning new things and you know the, the, the business skills rather than the FM skills. So we hear that a lot don't we that it's not about the skills it's about the attitude and behavior but we don't actually see it a lot in practice. I, th I think we still as an industry fall back to you know, has someone got an HVAC qualification or have they got IOSH or NEBOSH or something, yippee. I know they're important things, but that doesn't really align people with an organisation, does it? No, I don't have any of those things. Um, you know, I, d I don't have... Uh, I've got an expired IOSH. That's, that's as much as I've got, you know, and I've done okay. Um, I haven't been a member of the BIFM for years. I'm okay, I'm doing okay. So, you know, you don't have to be tied up with qualifications and letters after your name to, to get somewhere. Jackie, what about your team? Are they, have they all got FM backgrounds? Do you know, it's a really interesting question because I, I, I really resonate with some of the, the points that you've made there. So if I look at my team as a centre of excellence, as you'd expect, there's a lot of FM capability. 
um, in that group. And my team's just changed slightly, but if I refer back to when I joined GSK, um, huge fun, I joined, and it was right, okay, now you start to recruit your team. So I was encouraged to go externally, and then we had a recruitment freeze. So for six months, it was me. Um, we used some external agencies, but interestingly, when I went to use external agencies to do some of the work, I didn't use anybody from an FM background. So I used a company called Market Force, who work in the retail piece to do some research for us. I used a company called Elliott's, who are, um, can do um, PR and marketing and some exercises um, for us. And the very first person I recruited was from the pub company I worked for when I was made redundant, not quite the way you did it. The redundancy came first and then the job came later. Um, but I took a guy who worked for me there. He'd been a brand manager. Um, he'd lived and worked in pubs for all of his career. He was a superb business leader. Um, he understood the customer <coughs> more than anybody I know in real terms and for customer read employee. Um, and so he came in and started to pick up some of that work. The next guy I hired um, was a guy from GSK um, IT, or tech as we now have to call it, um, from GSK IT who came in and was our tech business partner and, and came in and became my commercial analytics director. So I started to apply some different principles and went for people who are experts in that field. Now there's three or four other members of my team who are absolutely both sides, client side, um, provider side have set up their own businesses who you know cut them open and they do bleed FM they 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 absolutely know the business it's quite a dynamic mix between the two I also took two people speaking to your point about the um, Asia market um, I would not appoint um, anybody from the West to go to the Asia market we wanted to recruit absolutely in, in market I've got a lady in um, China, who joined me from Sodexo, which went down really well because they're our provider for soft services. And I appointed a lady in Singapore who came from Cushman Wakefield. So they've got service provider backgrounds. The reason I did that is to have on the ground really clear understanding of the way things work. Um, this is a sweeping generalisation, but in FM specifically and in European markets, the multitasking thing is like a really you know, you see it on so many CVs, I can juggle 15 balls while everybody else can only juggle 10. They don't work that way in Asia. They take one piece of work, they do it really, really well, really thoroughly, they finish it, they start the next piece of work. That was a huge aha to me in terms of what I was looking for in a, in a global market in that, in that, um, in that work. So long-winded, but that's my answer. Thanks, Jackie. Mm -hmm. Adam, you've been two and a half months, did you say, at Pure Gym? So you've done something a bit differently if I... From, from one of our conversations before about bringing somebody into your team as a trainee? Yes, so we... Um, I, I think trainee is very different to assistant facilities manager and coordinator. Uh, a trainee for me is the, it goes back to probably my accounting days where a trainee goes through a very professional training program to get them to the next stage of their career. So I was lucky enough going through the interview process to be able to kind of say I wanted a trainee in the team and the team were looking at a young man um, that works in the gym to come and join. So I spent a bit of time with him yesterday and we talked about what his next stage was after his three months of settling in um, and making sure that he wants to do it and that it's a career for his future. Now, I haven't opened up his eyes yet because we're very much a maintenance function. So he's coming to Think FM with me in a couple of weeks and then we're gonna start working out what training program he should really have to get him to, to, to move forward in his career. Um, I obviously looked online um, when we knew I was gonna be on this panel and it was really, really interesting to see that um, from a trainee FM perspective, I couldn't find a single job advert out there with a proper training program or anything else. When I then suddenly looked for an, a trainee accountant's role, I could see over 500. This is the biggest difference that I think that we have to, to go forward with, is we should be making sure that we are having trainees, and trainees being that we are offering them a training plan to make them the next FM, the next senior FM, the next director and, and head of. You know, it, it just is what we've got to do. 
Um, but I'm, I'm starting my journey there and you know, I hope to add, it, it's going to be the next person that comes into the team. So I will be looking now at making sure we increase in our junior levels. We, we took a guy last, we take one individual every year to come and be an industrial placement student with us. Um, we piggyback on the back of the IT groups program. Um, so we took a guy in, um, Jack, um, he was simply outstanding. <coughs> what we put him to work on was our data analytics platform, so he was very confident in dealing with the guys in India who were running that, very confident because of his, his um, degree he was doing about how to work with the information. We put him forward for a GSK um, grad scheme, which is a three-year programme. I mean, to be honest, getting on that scheme, you, you've got to be something exceptional. They tend to lean towards more clinical things. So we've now kept Jack. We told him, you might as well work 10 hours a week from home for us, continuing this analysis, than work 10 hours <coughs> stocking shelves at Sainsbury's um, as, as he finished his degree. He's coming to us in June, and we're going to make his scheme for him. So we'll go into real estate, we'll go into hard services, soft services, he'll go into ops. He, he kind of knows our, our, our team. And he'll work it through over a period of time with a view that he might have thought he wanted to do IT, but we're leaning him now towards doing something different. But we did it because he's an exceptional individual and he knows what he's getting himself into. So both of you have talked about training people when you find these exceptional individuals or people who have a, an interest in coming into FM. Yeah. Are we training them in the right things, Nick? Um, it's a really interesting point because, um, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll probably answer that in two ways. Um, I think the first thing that we have to examine is um, the entry point for people into the FM industry because uh, you know, there is a, a, a groundswell, uh, a, w you know, within the industry that, uh, that talks to professionalising our industry. And I get that, and I support that. But I think we've got to be careful that we don't become too sniffy about people in our industry who don't have an FM background. Uh, I don't. I would describe, uh, and have described myself as a, a refugee from the shipbuilding and construction industry. Um, but, um, you know, we, we should remind ourselves that one of the things that makes the FM industry so, so rich and rewarding and challenging is the diverse background that people come from in that industry and the different ideas that they bring, the different processes that they, that they bring with them. And the, the second point I would like to make is that um, when I observe the skills gap, when I observe the things that people need training on, when I observe the tools that I believe that people would need to succeed. It's probably less related to subject matter expertise, uh, you know, whether that be a, uh, you know, a, a subdivision of the FM discipline or whether it be FM itself. It's all about leadership. It's about the ability to operationally and commercially understand and deliver <coughs> against the contract. It's about the ability to manage complex stakeholder groups who all want different things off you. I think uh, in your presentation earlier on, Adam, you, know, you were very, very clear about that in your, your illustration of, of the human body. You've got so many different stakeholder groups there who all want different things. Now, if we've got people in the FM discipline who are not able to navigate and, and, and impact and influence that stakeholder network, they will not succeed. They will not succeed if they cannot um, successfully execute a customer relationship. So as I see it, that's where the skills gap is and it's probably less, rela less relati uh, related to subject matter expertise. But our industry is offering training, isn't it, and development on all those, all the subject matter, the, 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 the maintenance, the... I, 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 I see that um, and I see some very, very good uh, and strong examples of that, but also I, I still see many, many instances, and I'm dealing with many, many instances, where people who have been advanced in the business based upon their performance in their last role, rather than their ability to successfully execute their next role and the one after that. I think it's a bit like I said earlier, didn't I, about Steve Jobs, you know, we're recruiting people and then we're not letting them 
fulfill their potential. Let me just very briefly read you this job ad, because I think this is quite relevant to what you've all been saying. So it's a, it's a vacancy for a facilities coordinator, and it's live at the moment. So this is how it starts. Are you prepared to be completely underwhelmed? Um, responsible for the management of the design, planning, acquisition, construction and maintenance of equipment, machinery, vehicles, building, offices and other facilities. Planning and administration of projects including budgets, accesses, modifications of the inst Shall I go on? Um, managing the reception function of the office, internal bags, courier, parcel service, as well as meeting rooms, warehouses and printers. Manages car fleet insurance, verification, holding, and, and on it goes. Um, the basic qualifications required are proficient in office tools and 80% English. I, I have no idea what that means. It says 80% English written and spoken. I, have, I literally have no idea what that means. Um, required education, a bachelor degree in engineering, architecture, business administration, or technical degree. And I read that and I thought, oh my goodness, this is the problem, isn't it? You know, is any, are any of your kids going to be inspired if they read something like that? And then at the very end, at the very end of the advert, is I think the most important bit. It says, working directly with amazing brands, you and your team will touch lives around the world. Get ready to be creative. Work with advanced technology and grow your skills with a pioneer in entertainment and technology. Join us at Walt Disney International and be part of the story. Isn't that in completely the wrong place? Because if you'd seen that, if your kids had seen that, wouldn't they go, wow, I want to be part of the Disney story? Yeah. Two completely different. Well, the, the Disney part is the is the brand part that you'll see everywhere on all over their, their marketing collateral, but the rest of it has been written probably by the head of facilities. And that really worries me. Jackie, any thoughts on that? Y yeah, I, I was mentoring a lady at GSK. I, I, it's something I love doing, but I like doing it with people who don't work in our function. So this lady works in the EHS um, function. She's been with us seven months. And she's like, right, what's next? Seven months. What you need to understand is prior to that, she worked for Philip Morris, so an FMCG where everything's bang, 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 moves at pace. And she's joined GSK in a function that is notoriously cautious and risk averse and is dying. She's absolutely dying. And I suddenly realized I'm a baby boomer having a conversation with a millennial. Because what I was saying to her is, well, you need to stick with it for about a year and a half because it'll look bad on your CV. A word's not a hope. If something doesn't change, I, I, I'm off. And it made me realize that we need to be really careful about if we're bringing young people, what is their past experience? Because it'll give you a good indication of what their expectation is. Because she's in the wrong job. And I would be in deep trouble if I'd anybody found out what I did, which was right, you need to be coming and working in my team. So don't leave the organisation, but you can't, you can't carry on work, we'll lose you if you carry on working in this function, because you're just in the wrong place. So I think being really careful, okay, getting this piece right, but being really careful, what is their past experience in real terms, relative to what your organisation's real culture is? You've got to hold the mirror up. So my colleagues from AstraZeneca may or may not agree with me, but Pharma moves slowly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's okay. It's okay to take ten to fifteen years to take something from a molecule to a to a drug. So everything kind of moves at that. Well, you know, tomorrow we'll do. And we've got to have the process. We've got to dot the i's. We've got to cross the t's. Don't bring somebody in from an FMCG or from retail to that. The, the words I was given when I started were, "Please don't go native on us." And as Liz well knows, it's a struggle I have every day. Not to think, oh, phew, nobody cares. I'll do just you, do you think there's slower. any difference, and this is to all of you really, is there any difference in these issues between being an in house member of an FM team or working for a service provider? I mean, Nick, Joe, you've both, I think you've all worked for service providers yeah, as well. I, I think from my point of view, um, I don't think there is any difference, to be honest with you, because uh, I think, firstly, um, it, it, it's all about seeing your, your, your stakeholder from their end of the telescope, whether, you, whether you're a, a, you know, a customer. <laughs> Uh, or a service provider, and uh, I think with um, the, the more intelligent customers that I've come across in the marketplace, uh, and I count GSK and 
uh, AstraZeneca, and we heard from uh, uh, our, our colleague in Asia this morning, I would count both of those organisations as amongst the more intelligent customers that I've, uh, I've come across, that there is that, uh, that shared sense of purpose. Uh, you know, and, and this all comes back to the point that I was making earlier on about uh, you know, people's ability to, to, to navigate and influence multiple stakeholders, identify that shared sense of purpose, you know, and, and it, it, it plays into leadership as well. You've got to energise people uh, to, to share the sense of purpose that you have. I absolutely disagree. Really? Couldn't disagree more. Um, I am criticised for being too supportive of Sodexo because they come in to do a job against a spec that we spent an eternity writing saying this is what we want you to do and then what do we do? Get in the way and say no 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 no. don't do that next month next quarter that'll be okay we slow it down Mm -hmm. because I know from my background and experience the way they want to work and we in my humble opinion, wrongly, make them work our way. And it's wrong. Why, why, why buy a partner to do it your way? Did you, did you want to add something? Yeah, I think, I think. Jen, uh, Jackie, I've got in the back row. I'm the global head of a client uh, pharmaceutical business. Um, I've worked at Sedato, I've worked at CBRE, I've been on both sides of the fence and running large portfolios. And um, it is different, and I think, um, the market at the moment with the commercial models that are out there is causing us a problem in the market because the provider has not got enough wriggle room to provide the quality level of service. And when you've got the AD global guy sitting there from Sodexo or CBRE, he has two masters to bring. He's got a client driving him for service, trying to create a solution that provides the right solution for the core business or R&D output or whatever it might be. And he has to hit his margin, he has to hit his targets. And I'm sitting there with my global AD saying, right, I need an expert here, 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 and here, in my business, to support core activity. And, and it's successful. And the last two years, it's been a commercial nightmare trying to drive, to hit my budgets, but he's really hold the provider accountable to hit the targets of the degree on the other side. So I think it's, and then that links into the core competencies that we need as a client team to what you need as a provider team, and that's different. Uh, we, we have a, a development plan for our guys, and we've got five core competencies all our teams need in my structure. Um, you know, and you're picking up people that haven't actually got all those day one, but you have to develop them, and it is passion. And it's understanding what value those guys add to core business. But that, that, that commercial pressure is, is never going to go away, and, and, to some, and to a certain extent, I think as a service provider, it kind of keeps us right sometime, just, just my opinion. But um, you know, I now see examples where um, the commercial pressure is coming in a different way. It's not always bottom up or we need to find half a million quid, what are we going to do? Uh, actually, there are more intelligent approaches and, and I think this does happen with GSK where it's, it's top down. We're actually looking at ways that we can better deliver the business. Uh, I, I'm saying we there, I'm slip of the tongue, I don't work with Sodexo anymore. Yeah, we, 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 can, we can better deliver the business together with shared objectives and the outcome is a uh, you know, better commercial uh, position for the operation. So we just have that conversation. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm really interested to see what the reaction is going to be from the internal GSK finance function when I've said to them, don't come in with two and six off fitness mm. or 50 grand off meetings, services, start at the top and tell us what you want from us. And so start at the top with, okay, if you pay me in 30 days, I can give you X. If you extend my contract by a year or two years or three years, I can give you Y. Start with what, the stuff that doesn't cost us anything, but gets us the result we want and it's a win-win situation. Too often we start with, well, if we just have one less lab concierge, or we just have one less, and it's like creeping death yeah. to get to a million so pounds. Earlier, yeah. Starting with task and, and labour, I think the the change I'm seeing is that collaboration through the purchasing structure. So, you know, 
B&Q used a computer system, you loaded it into the computer system, if you were lucky enough to spit out the end, you'd sit down and have a conversation maybe about what it was that you wanted to work together on. But you had to put your A, Bs and Cs in the right boxes to get to that next stage. I am seeing, and it's very slowly at the moment, but I'm seeing that you are holding the collaboration meetings before you are going actually out for your RFI and your RFP. So you're actually pulling people in that fit your culture, fit your wants, fit your needs, and, and moving forward. And then you start getting into your commercial conversation. Well, we have to do that. Always drive behaviour. Whatever it is, Absolutely. it drives behaviour in both businesses and anyone you're working with. And I think that's one of our challenges, is we've got to look, got to look at the commercials, at the way we write our contracts, the way we procure our contracts, because the behaviour and the, the skills that we're demanding will come as a result of that. We're finding more and more that the retained FM organisation, so the people heading up FM within a client organisation, once they've outsourced, or even second, third, fourth generation, is they are being abandoned um, to miraculously overnight develop skills that are strategic and commercial and business focused and the ability to manage internal stakeholders without anybody telling them that their role has changed. And that's why I think clients get in the way of service providers because these people don't have the, haven't been upskilled, haven't been told what their new role needs to be. And I think, Mike, I think that's a little bit like so you were alluding to. service providers are rewarded as well uh, you know I'm conscious that we're talking about the skills gap here but um, your current service provider I will, I will describe them as that you know they operate um, five prisons for example and everybody from the governor down is a Sodexo employee and one of the principal means of incentivization within that uh, contract is based upon the reoffend the rate of reoffending of uh, individuals who have been through that end-to-end -end system that's delivered by Sodexo. That, oh, that's a brave move. That's a really intelligent move. And, you know, we need to see more and more incentivization uh, of service providers through things like that, rather than just fee on cost, in my opinion. Yes, yeah, so let's bring us back to the skills gap a little bit. Joe. I know you, you you're... Um I wouldn't say a naysayer when it comes to things like BIFM and IFMA and RICS, but you, you've been quite critical of them in the past. And, and you've talked about how we, we do have a tendency to get together like this and talk about the same old things. So what do you think we should do? Um, yes, I have I have um, previously had conversations with the BIFM probably a couple of years ago now, you know, working in a quite a forward thinking organisation and they would say, look, however many members have got, 40,000 members cannot be wrong, you're wrong. You know, facilities isn't changing, it won't change, this is, this is how it's always going to be. So very interested to see how the new, um, the new world of BIFM, IWFM, is that, is that right? I think that's the, that's the suggestion, the, the, new the one. Institute of um, Workplace and Facilities Management. Interested to see how, how that will pan out. And I actually invited them in to see me a couple of weeks ago and said, look, if you're serious about changing, I'm happy to, to do what I can to support because we're the kind of organisation that you need behind you because at the minute you're an embarrassment and I don't want to have anything <laughs> to do with you because it's, it's full of, um, can I say it, old dinosaurs? <coughs> You just have. Sorry. Um, <laughs> that very, very fly. Um, that just that's not how that's not how we work. And there are so many other organisations like us that we need somebody. We need somebody to to um, you know to, to go to. And, and when we were talking this morning about the academic papers, to share that. So very interested to see how um, how that pans out. Um, and actually, whilst I've been here today, they've. Um, the editor of FM World has sent me an email asking for my comment on the new name change. Um, but, you know, if we're still talking about that three months later, how much confidence do I have that actually, you you know, let's get over the name change now, it's done, 
let's move on and see and see what you can actually, um, you know, put your money where your mouth is. Um, so, which leads us nicely on to um, not just talking about it and actually doing something. Um, we've all got some homework. Actually, no, not homework, because you're not leaving this room to have lunch until it's done. Um, we've got <laughs> post-it notes and pads at the end of each bank of desks. Um, and I think what would be really good is, you know, going back to what I was saying about us all having a responsibility, is if each of us commits to something, um, you know, pledges something, whether it be um, making some time to, to be a mentor or actually, you know, in six months' time, I am going to recruit a trainee into, into my organisation. Um, it would be very powerful if, if each of us did this, you know, everyone in the room, on the panel, all the organisers, um, just so that then in the next six months we can come back and discuss how, how it's gone, not necessarily just for the for the person that we, or people that we're doing it for, but also how much it's, it's enriched us and in, in made us better leaders, better better employees, um, and we can collaborate on this. You know, it's kind of an open open to discussion, really. Okay, so what do you think? You up for that? This is this is yes. I've got a pledge. I'm going to bring Jack to the next FM Inspired, so he can tell you what happened. I think that's a really good idea. So there's post-its at the end of each line. So if so, whoever's sitting at the end, could you pass post-its along to your colleagues? Everybody grab a pen. What we'd like you to do is to just write down a short pledge, something small, a small step you're going to take between now and October, which is the next FM Inspired. Put your name on it. Before we go to lunch, we're going to ask you to put them on the boards by the door. We're going to photograph them, and we're going to email them out to all of you so you remember what you've written. Okay, so a small pledge from everybody that's going to help help move the industry forward, help close the skills gap, make a difference to people coming into our industry. Okay, does everybody have pens? So we're going to give you a couple of minutes now. Feel free to um, collaborate, if that helps. Discuss with the person next to you. Looks like some of you are really working fast and have written your pledge already. Who needs some more time? If you need more time, please stick your hand in the air. Oh, wow, okay. I think maybe we should, we should hear some of these pledges even before we see them on the board. What do you think? We've got a couple of minutes. Michael, you finished early. Would you share your pledge with us? Um, a big Im Oh, sorry, thank you. A big imp impetus for us is flexi so work anywhere anytime any place etc so we uh, we've got traction but we haven't got enough traction so my pledge is to go deeper and broader with flexi across sap who else would like to just share with us while we've got a couple of minutes who's going to be my next victim Vol volunteer i learned a new word last week which is voluntold you heard that before caroline you look like you finished your pledge would you like I'm to voluntold am i been voluntold oh. am i um, I am going, I'm in the process of recruiting two graduates into FM and engineering, so create a really exciting orientation plan for them, that they don't leave. Um, so I work for an FM service provider, and just some of the conversation, I think sometimes us as service providers, we do have quite good training plans for our FMs, for our staff, we maybe don't share that enough because we keep it quite internal and internally focused. So I've just put to ensure that a full training plan goes into my next offer so that my clients are satisfied that their teams are going to have the right skills to deliver the role. And all these things will make such a difference. It's going to be amazing. Please make sure that you've put your name on the post-it note as well. And we'll ask you before you go to lunch just to pop them up on the two boards by the door. So Jackie, you've told us about your pledge to bring Jack along. Adam, what's your pledge going to be? We might as well do it together, so I'll, I'll get Ben here and they can share their journey over the, the next few months. It makes sense. I think what also, just going back to I'd like to understand, how many people have got what they were classed as trainees within their business at the moment in FM? So was that, about seven, six, seven? I mean, let's be honest, the only people in this room that can change that is ourselves. 
and I don't believe for a second that none of us can afford the salary to bring on a trainee and train them up. I mean, what do we reckon? I've, could we double that number by the next time we're sat in this room? Because only seven more of you. It wasn't <laughs> like there was a lot. <laughs> I mean, probably not even £100,000 worth of investment into our own industry. I mean, that's, let, let's be honest, that's small fry, isn't it? So I would love just to see that that number double. Okay, thanks. Nick, what's your pledge going to be? I'm going to commit to spending the learning and development budget on learning and development this year. <laughs> uh, and for the right reasons, uh, with the right outcomes in mind, rather than just recovering as much of the apprentice levy as I can. Thank you. Joe. <laughs> um, my, my first one is, uh, something that's really helped me is, as I've gone through my career, I've made quite big leaps in terms of senior, seniority and, and role. Um, and something that's really helped me is mentoring. Um, by a number of different people and I think something that I'm quite um, passionate about is freeing up some of my time so that I can do that for, for someone else or you know two other two other people over the next six six twelve months um, and then I have one head count left to fill I will make it a trainee there you go. so we've gone from seven to eight already <laughs> fantastic okay um, I guess I should make a pledge as well. We, we really struggle in my business to find good people. So I think we need to look at maybe bringing in a, a graduate, someone who has come from a completely different sector. You know, because a lot of what we do is training, I keep thinking about bringing somebody in from dramatic arts or, or music or modern languages, something that's just different, but it's still about giving someone great communication skills. So my, my COO is sitting there <laughs> looking at me now thinking, are you committed to spending money again? <laughs> but I think that's what we'll do. We'll commit to, uh, to looking for a graduate to bring into our business. So, Well, I think we're, we're almost at lunch. So we'll ask you all please to um, pop your post-it notes up on the board. As I said earlier, we'll take some photographs of them. We'll get them sent out to you so that when we come back together, and I hope you'll all come back in October, we'll revisit how many of those ple pledges we've actually managed to achieve. Because we're the only people, as Adam said, we're the only people that can make the change. We can't just expect other people in the industry to do it. So I'm not going to do a sum up because I think the conversations will continue over lunch. Uh, lunch is in the room just next door. So please join me in saying a huge thank you to Adam, Jackie, Nick and Joe. Thank you all very much. <laughs>